Thank you so much for coming to this workshop right now. I know there's a bunch of other awesome workshops happening too, and it's hard to decide which one to come to. So thank you to, for coming to this one. I'm really excited to share in the next 50 minutes with you guys. Come on in. Um, the tools and tips that I've learned really in the last 20 years, but specifically in the last seven years since I've been a full-time farmer of how I personally have figured out some pretty easy, doable ways of getting food on the table every night, especially when I'm exhausted from working full time in the fields. So um, I'm excited to share this stuff with you guys. Eating local, seasonal, sustainable food is what I'm passionate about. It's my career, and I'm just so happy to have a room full of people to get to share this stuff with. So sincerely, thank you all for being here. Um, so I am the co-owner and farmer at Lower Valley Farm here in Kalispell, Montana. We do uh, four acres of certified organic vegetables, and we're feeding about 500 people a week through all the different places that we um, sell to. Um, when I'm not farming, I'm a mom of three young kids, and I'm an avid home cook. I did not grow up eating farm fresh food. Um, I grew up in Indiana <laughs> with two pretty young parents, a working class family, and lots of the local vor and local food and organic food books that I read, and I always have a stack of them that I'm reading. Almost everybody has a story about growing up eating like in their grandma's kitchen, like food is a part of their childhood. And for me, it really wasn't. And I know there's lots of people just like me, like being without a food history is actually more normal than growing up with cooking. Um, so how did I come to be where I'm at now is an interesting story. And I'm only gonna spend about five minutes on that, but I do wanna share it with you. Um, as if I think it's a small miracle, but somehow in the early 80s, in the Midwest, not at a special doctor, just like at a regular doctor's office, our pediatrician made the link for my mom that there is a connection between my brother's inability to sit still in school and what we ate. Wow, like it was a while ago, that's a connection that's still not made sometimes. And so we were encouraged to not eat very much processed food, no food coloring, and um, no MSG, which isn't as common now, but it was then. And so my sweet young mama did that. And it was really overwhelming for her, and I don't think it brought her any joy. <laughs> it was just like a burden. And so, yay, come in. Hi, guys. So from a very early age, I did have that link somewhere back there of food and health. And I'm so grateful for that. All of you who are educators, like what you do matters. Little bitty seeds, they matter. Another thing that my family did is that we tried to sit down for dinner. It didn't always happen, but it was an intention. It was a goal. It was um, something that was important. And that we always prayed before we eat dinner. And um, no matter what your faith background is or isn't, uh, my dad had some really beautiful words he said before we ate dinner. And this is like, we don't have a farm connection, but he always said, as part of our dinner blessing, thank you for this food, may it nourish us and help us do good work. Like, wow, there's a lot going on in that. <laughs> Despite any disagreements that I might have with my parents about faith. <laughs> That's a really grounding and a part of my uh, food foundation. So um, as I look at a lot of the local food voices that are happening and are part of, that I'm so excited are part of a conversation right now, my own personal history of eating with intention, a leak between food and health, gratitude for food, it has nothing to do with farm fresh food. 
and it's built a foundation for me that I'm very, very thankful for. It's also something that I don't necessarily always see as being part of the foundation of local seasonal eating, and I think that it could be. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a couple of minutes. Um, having a foundation for yourself, no matter what your foundation might be, can free us from obstacles to change that we wanna make. And obstacles to change, especially, I think, for women, but for everybody. Um, if we can let go of food guilt, of what we think we could and should and ought to be doing, and if we can rely on our foundation of what we know is true for us, we're gonna be able to make so many small, sustainable changes that are gonna stick, that are gonna land, that we can share with our family and with our community. So growing up, this was our favorite thing to have for dinner. It was pork chops with applesauce and back salad. <laughs> so this is all real food, right? Like it's not really a standard American diet. It's not processed. And it was doing what the doctor said and it made a difference. Um, when I was the age that my kids are now, I would not have known maybe that pork is a pig. Probably didn't know that. I mean, definitely wouldn't have been able to identify like the cut of meat on an animal. I knew apples came from like were made from applesauce, apples because it's in the name, but like I wouldn't have known chop them up, add water, add heat, and that's what makes applesauce. And I am embarrassed. <laughs> Until I was like 22, I thought that coleslaw was like lettuce. <laughs> because it was always just in the bag. So that started to change for me when I made the radical transition from Indiana to Illinois. <laughs> and when I went to college, um, it would have been really useful, I can see now, to have had a degree in culinary arts, or agriculture, or nutrition. But I didn't get any of those degrees, I was just a weird art school kid. <laughs> so, um, I barely knew how to boil water. I didn't know how to cook at all. But I walked into this really groovy local grocery store. I got a job there. And they had free cooking classes. I took them all. I just hung out with the people who worked there. I wanted to like bulk foods. Had never seen it before. Wanted to know how to use every single thing. Wanted to know what to do with every herb. I was really excited about it, and I continue to be. And I began my cookbook obsession. So that was 20 years ago, <laughs> and. Now, my kids have had this amazing blessing in their life of growing up, they definitely know that's pork, because it was like, if we didn't grow it ourselves, we met it at the farm where it was grown. We picked the apples to make the applesauce, and we love playing the game as this cabbage, <laughs> as big as your head. <laughs> so, I'm so thankful to eat this way, and I want to share this with everybody, but as I go back and I think about my mom and her kitchen, in Indiana with two little kids when she was 23. Like, oh yeah, now you're supposed to like pick the apples. Like, what are you talking about? Like, how is this accessible? And even for those of us that aren't like my mom, like me, who I want to do more. Like, I do a pretty good job of fermenting and freezing and canning, but I want to do more. And how do I put that expectation on myself? How does anybody? How do we make this work? In the farm to table movement that I love and cherish, there's this whole part in between. And it's left to home cooks to get the food from the farm to the table, right? How can we do more of that? And as I ask myself that question and just let it percolate over and over, I see that if we start with an intention that's specific and we set up habits, routines, and rituals that support that intention, we're gonna be able to get to our goal, whatever that specific goal is. When I'm talking to people at Market, I've got everybody from somebody who just left the doctor's office with a diagnosis and wants to make a change in how they eat, to people who are making a goal to try to eat five vegetables a day, and then like people who are already eating totally seasonally and wanna do more whole spectrum and we all have a lot in common and it's this but if you want change you make one small change at a time and they're gonna add up 
Unfortunately, when we want to make changes, as we all know, there's lots of obstacles to change. And I've identified three that I think are really specific to making changes in the kitchen. Habits that don't match your goals. We're going to talk about that more specifically later. This is a big one. This is one I really struggle with. It's a myth of perfection. I think especially in the time of Instagram and Pinterest, it's so easy to have an idea of what our food should look like. And then what it actually looks like, it doesn't always match, right? <laughs> and then the big one is time. And when you start to get too many of these obstacles, I, we have a joke on the farm, like, ah, oh, my hair is on fire. That's the feeling, like, I'm so far behind. And so how can we combat these obstacles to change and set us up for success? And this is something that when I, lots of the, especially the real food resources, whole food resources, I just feel like, like Martha, Michael, do you guys have these problems? <laughs> Am I the only one? And luckily, I get to talk to real people every week at market, and lots of you are here today. Thank you. Um, and at our farm stand, and that pick up our CSA box. And I know I'm not the only one. I know that everybody has a hard time doing as much as they want to do. We're going to talk about specific rituals and habits. Because what we don't want to be setting up is a situation where you have to use willpower to make change because it's not sustainable. If we can identify rituals and habits to make a part of your routine, this is gonna be stuff that can, you can build on over a long term. So hopefully today while I'm giving this presentation, you're gonna have specific ideas that you're like, yeah, that works for me. And a bunch of it's gonna be like, there's no way that that works for me. And that's all totally cool. Like one, two, maybe three things if you leave here today that are gonna work for you. I'm so excited about that they're going to build up over time. <coughs> so I've broken the changes into seven specific things and I'm going to move through them pretty quickly because there's just a ton of content here. Um, the first is to make buying seasonal produce a habit. And this might seem like a no-brainer, but I see this all the time that customers want to come to market, but like Saturdays, doesn't, it just doesn't work. And it's never going to work because of so many reasons that a Saturday morning would <laughs> work, right? Um, so if you know that going to the market or signing up for a CSA or having a garden doesn't work for you and there's no way that you can think of to make it work with you, let's just put that thought on hold for a minute, okay? These are the options that might work for you. CSA, market, farm stand, and then we have quite a few grocers that, well, actually, one. <laughs> <laughs> the produce buyer for Mount Valley Foods here today, and she is amazing, and they do a really, really good job of having high quality local produce at their store. So that is a larger time window that's available to be able to buy, have access to local seasonal food, which is a wonderful thing and gift to our community. Um, if going to a separate place that's outside of your routine doesn't work for you, I'm going <laughs> to... Okay, so if one of the first three does work for you, the best tip that I have ever had, and I got this from one of our customers, is to set an alarm on your phone to remind you every week to go. And if it's not going to work for you, do not beat yourself up about it. You can use more produce that's not local. Just use more produce, like that's a place you could start. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't beat yourself up for it, about it if it doesn't work for you. Now if you do wanna make it to market and you know you can't make it every Saturday, make a goal. Put it on your calendar, twice a summer, right? And then do it. And if you can't, if you're sick, if something happens, be kind to yourself. Second habit, this is like my favorite, is to store vegetables so that you use them. And I've got a handout about this I'm gonna hand out at the end so you don't have to copy everything off of the slides. Um, <clears throat> the most ideal, well, okay, let me backpedal a little bit here. Since 
Uh, starting the firm, I've read a lot about efficiency and design and how to set employees up for success to spend less time doing tasks. And as soon as I started reading this stuff, I was like, has anybody written a book about this like for kitchens? Where's this book? It's not out there yet. Um, so I'm going to share some of the tips that I've learned from like lean farm design that I apply to my own kitchen with you guys. Um, I think if you put stuff away that's chopped up and ready to go, you're like seriously a million times more likely to use it. Basic 101 stuff about storing vegetables is even if it was harvested the day before, you have to put it in a plastic or glass container before it goes in your fridge because your fridge is like a food dehydrator. There's air in there all the time. So if the carrots were harvested yesterday and they go in the fridge not in a bag, they're going to be limp and horrible in like 12 hours. So the freshness component gets negated by the condition inside of an air conditioner. Um, I'm going to encourage you in the next 15 minutes to put stuff away already chopped up, but if that doesn't work for you and you don't have time, just putting things away in your fridge in their own individual bag so that each thing is by itself gets you more shelf life on the produce because they all have different perishability days. For root crops, if you take the tops off of the roots, it makes the tops last longer and the roots last longer. So store them separately. Now I know a lot of you in here know that you can eat the tops off of all of these root crops. If you know that you're not going to eat them, do not put them in your refrigerator. Thank you carrot tops. Return to the earth. Okay, they do not need to take up space in your fridge if you're never going to use them. Now, if starting to use carrot tops is an intention you have, I'm going to show you some specific ways to get to that goal. Okay, but if you know you're not going to, you can be like, hey, Mandy said I can throw this away. <laughs> okay? You can. Because if you know you're not going to use them, just go ahead and say thank you. Goodbye. Okay? But if you are going to keep them, keep them separately. When they're attached, then the top thinks it's still like growing and it's pulling water out of the roots. And so the roots don't stay crisp for quite as long, and the tops stay better, fresher, longer on their own in their own little plastic bag. So that's a cool tip about storing root crops. I keep the things that last the longest in my crisper, so that's going to be like in a plastic bag a cabbage will keep for like three or four weeks. Same with cauliflower and romanesco, they'll keep a really long time down there, so you're uh, root vegetables if they're each in their own bag. So that all goes down in the crisper. Stuff that you're going to use in the next three to five days I keep in the middle. And then things that are very perishable and or that I know I'm eating in the next 24 hours go on the top shelf. And that's with uh, herbs and microgreens right in the front on the top shelf. Like in the most easy to see place. We don't want those to go bad. So we've got our veggies separate, we've got our roots separate from the tops, we've got them um, in order from most perishable at the top to least perishable at the bottom. I don't go to the market to shop, right? But Saturday is my day to restock my fridge because it's the day I come home with all the extra stuff from market. So I'm doing the same weekly kind of thing that I encourage my customers to do. And when I bring in my tubs of vegetables that are going to fit in my fridge for the week, I like to have an hour to chop stuff up and get it in there put away and ready to use. Now that might not work for everybody, and that's kind of like an ambitious goal. If you don't have an hour when you come home from getting your CSA box or from market, then set a timer on your on your little oven timer for five to ten minutes and just you'll be surprised how much you can get done in five to ten minutes and put it away already chopped up. It's so much easier to use stuff when it's ready to go and a nice place to start with this is just putting your baby greens away washed in a bowl ready to go on the table. <coughs> so as you think about how you currently store vegetables, 
what are habits and rituals and routines that you could create for yourself to meet the goals of using more fresh produce at home? The next change is one that I don't <laughs> It's really easy to run into the myth of perfection. Like, this Instagram pantry, <laughs> I love going to people's houses and seeing how they store their food and I'm always paying attention to it because I'm like looking for tips and tricks and I've yet to see anything that looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> like whoever has like the cupcakes, you know, like no, yeah. We make cupcakes and we eat them. <laughs> they come on display. So this is my pantry at home and you know you might look at that and be like, wow, that looks like way too minimal or like that looks way too organized. There's no way I could do that. I live in like a nineteen seventy eight mobile home. This is a closet with the door taken off that I painted. You know, everybody has a space when you look at your kitchen, how could I be using my space in a way that's a little more efficient for me? And specific tips here, because you can go online and type in real food pantry, what to keep stocked in your pantry, and all of these guides are like, have 200 things on them. It has like 200, like 180 of them are things that I never keep stocked. So what, the, what are the things that you use all the time that you always like to have on hand? Not the things that you would like to be using, or that you think you should be using. The things you actually use all the time. What are like 10 to 20 things that if you're out of them, you're like, oh, I can't make dinner. Right? Everybody has a list like that. So of those things, if you can keep them in clear jars, they don't have to be glass. Maybe eventually you want glass. You know, and you could transition. That's a goal you could have. Um, but clear containers not stacked too deep and where you can see what you have makes it so much easier to make a shopping list so that you're not spending tons of time doing inventory or like going to make something and realizing you're out of what you need it's so frustrating so um, keeping similar things together also really helps with making a grocery list for me um, I like to keep my pastas grains and cereals together my canned goods together, my salts, herbs, and spices are like religiously stocked because I can be like, oh, how can I be out of smoked paprika? <gasps> <laughs> I can't be expected to make dinner. <laughs> you know, like, so I like to keep those very well stocked. Um, I keep my alliums down in a little drawer down here. Um, and then your go-to cooking oil and fat is something you should never be out of and if you if making salad dressings is something that's easy for you and is part of your routine then you should always have those vinegars and oils in stock if it's not and you just cannot make making a salad dressing work for you when it goes on sale buy a case of it and keep it so that you're never out of it so what are things that you can identify in your pantry that are habits, rituals, and routines that can help you get to your goal of cooking more seasonal food? The next step is kitchen tools, and this could be like a seven day workshop, right? <laughs> so I really love cooking, I have a small kitchen, I'm very careful about what I bring into the kitchen, am I going to use this, is this multi-use, um, do I love using this? Is it something that serves me? I am constantly like wanting new things. And so my actual pep talk I give to myself when I'm putting stuff in my Amazon talk is like, hey, most families in the world feed their family everything they make came from them locally. That's all the food they have and they don't have running water. Like put the put that back. <laughs> Take it out of the Amazon cart. You don't need the spiralizer. I really want it. <laughs> so this is the pared down list of what I'd say is your absolute necessities to have in your kitchen. Um, probably the only thing on there that's going to be an unfamiliar thing is the Debbie Myers green bags. Those are really cool. 
If you have a problem of stuff going bad, like fresh produce going bad in your fridge, just switching out from a conventional produce bag to the Debbie Meyers green bag gets you like four or five more days of longevity um, for greens and for root vegetables. They just keep forever in those crazy bags. Now of these things, if you don't have a nice knife, you know, save up for one because it's so indispensable. And that's the same with any of the things on these lists. If you're like, oh, I, I don't have that. Um, it's worth saving up for. And then if there's specific cooking skills and techniques that you'd like to be using that you aren't currently using, this is a really good place to set up a specific intention. So if you want to start steaming more, you are going to need to have the tools to do that. Um, and that's true for all of the techniques I'm going to go through here. This is a specific one for my family. I know we have like Taco Tuesday and then we also do like grill night and I, the kids love grill night and they love making their own kebabs. And so um, having a grill basket, kebab sticks and having some avocado oil always on hand is really important for us because we love grilling vegetables. I know lots of people do a stir fry once a week and for lots of our uh, market CSA customers, that's the like day before you get your new stuff. You just clean it all out and stir fry it all. I have a really big cast iron skillet that I use for doing stir fry. It's so annoying to do stir fry and have it like, flinging all over the place. Um, stir fry is a great thing to make enough to last two nights and maybe have it for lunch <coughs> the next couple days. Fermentation can seem so intimidating and if it's something that you've been wanting to do more of, all you need to get started are glass jars and salt and fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. So it's a cool place to be like, hey, I've noticed that I always have a little bit of extra before my next shopping day and I want to start fermenting, like doing a little batch of ferments a week. Just keep the glass jars and salt on hand and you can. For anybody who loves making soup, it's a good idea to get an immersion blender and to have a high quality heavy bottomed pan, potter pan. Um, I remember when Jay and I saved up for our first heavy bottom pan and we were like, yay, it's soup night! And we were just like so happy to saute things on a heavy bottom instead of a really low quality pan that we've been using forever. Um, freezing is one of my, and this is because it's March in my freezer <laughs> right now, <laughs> it's not a happy place. <laughs> it's like, oh, I guess I didn't label anything. <laughs> and so, um, this year, I'm making a goal to keep my freezer bag stocked. I, I'm going to label everything. I'm going to have two freezers full by October 31st. That's my goal for the year. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to always have my nice ice cube trays in stock. Right? The ones I used last year like leaky. Those are going to be gone. And uh, always have my freezer bags and my sharpies. So I don't need a whole lot of stuff, but you know what I'm going to do with that stuff? It's all gonna be in one little thing so that when I wanna free something, I don't have an obstacle of having to find the bags, find the markers. Like it's easy stuff, but like when you're tired, it can be hard to get stuff done, right? But dehydrating is another goal for me to do better with this year. There's this dehydrator that I want. It's really expensive. So right now I'm saving up for that dehydrator, but every time I turn the dehydrator on that I have, I'm gonna say, thank you, dehydrator. I'm so grateful for you. Like, you're making me all this food. Um, and I'm gonna uh, dehydrate a patch of produce every week. And when it's apple and cherry season, I'm gonna pay my kids to, to do the dehydrator for me. Okay, so, like, I've got specific things I'm gonna do to be able to do more this year. And so that takes us out of the kitchen tools and moves us into the next step which is meal prep. And I know for lots of people, like even when you hear the word meal prep, you just kind of shut down, like, oh, I'm not gonna do that. That's how I feel about freezer meals. Like when I envision like pre-made frozen meals in the freezer, I'm just like, nope, I can't. Okay, so that's how you feel about meal prep. That's cool. I am gonna try and encourage you to find 10 or 20 minutes somewhere in your week to do something that looks like meal prep. I'm also going to kind of take off maybe some of your ideas about what meal prep might be. 
So I don't use recipes for meal prep. I just make food during meal prep, okay? Um, I've got five hacks here to kind of help you out with the meal prep. And the first one is one that I just never see anywhere. And I'm like, how is nobody writing this? Right? I don't always like cooking. Yeah. Like, I don't feel like Martha and Michael feel that way. But I feel that way. Like, I don't always like it. And guess what? I still do it. And I could not be more connected to the earth and the soil and the seasonality. I love this stuff. But I'm not so blissed out on it that I feel like cooking. Okay? <laughs> and how is this not a part of the local food conversation? How do we find the energy to do this even when you don't want to? And part of that for me is this first meal prep hack, which is, let me skip to this, is that you're not always going to feel like doing it, but it's always worth it. Now, where can that come from? That comes from my foundation. That comes from not a place of guilt. It comes from knowing that it's worth it because food is directly linked to my and my family's health. So like, I don't feel like doing this, but I'm gonna do this, okay? And if I'm having those feelings, I recognize that they're just feelings and they're okay feelings to have and I let go of the feelings. Does that make sense? Like, hey, I'm not feeling good about doing this food prep. And that's okay. I don't always have to like doing it. I think that that's really a missing part of the message. Sometimes I feel like, like, what's wrong with me? But I know from talking to so many people that we kind of all share this. Like there's times where you don't feel like doing it and you just do. Um, so I like give myself the pep talk, hey girl. Just cook for 30 minutes, you'll be glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> and then I am, right? So that's my number one. And I think that's where 90% of it at is, is like making a routine where you set aside some time to do your routine. You have to make time for it or else you're not gonna do it, right? Um, if meal prep sounds intimidating because it's like too much like planning, just start with 20 minutes. For me, it's on Sunday. And start with making a salad and chopping some raw vegetables. My second hack is just to have the bowl full of salad ready to go. And that might sound really simple and really basic, but the really big Pyrex glass um, bowl fits a one pound of baby greens. And if I know that that's in there and I come and I put it on my table and then I start making dinner, I like look at the table and I'm like, oh, I can do this. Okay, so like, for me, for whatever reason, that bowl full of salad in my fridge is like, I got this. Um, the third one is my weekly cook up. So I spend between 60 to 90 minutes on Sunday um, cooking some food. And I set a timer and I just pre chop as much stuff at once as I can. And what this does is like, it's messy to make food, so if all at once I'm making a mess, I am so much more likely to put cooked greens in my eggs in the morning if they're pre-cooked. Because like, the eggs just went in the skillet, I just put them in. My cheese is pre-shredded, I put it on. And it's like, takes so much less time to cook that way than chopping and sauteing every single time you go to make anything. Because I put vegetables on everything. So it's so much more efficient to have it all ready to go. So I set a timer, I'm pre-chopping, I'm pre-cooking as many things as possible, I make an egg bake for breakfast, I make a big roast or a batch of meatballs, um, I usually have some cooked beans or lentils and a cooked grain, make hard boiled eggs, and I do a big uh, pan of root vegetables or a Dutch oven full of them. And I cut and saute a large thing of greens. Pre sauteing your greens is also a great way to get more greens to fit in your fridge. Because, like, you know, this much, like a whole case basically of bok choy goes down to one Pyrex container mm -hmm. that I can use all week. And then, if I don't get through it all at the end of the week, 
it's pre-cooked and we can just put it in a freezer bag. So um, setting aside time to do this is so helpful. I'd also really recommend starting your cleanup on your 90 minutes or whatever your time ends up being. If you're doing 20 minutes, you should start cleaning up 10 minutes before you're done. If you're doing 90 minutes, start cleaning up 10 minutes before you're done because if you don't, it ends up taking longer than you thought, and the next time you go to cook, it's like, oh no, it takes so much longer than I thought it would. Include the cleanup time in your total prep time, if that makes sense. So at the end of this, you're gonna have all of this food, and the more practice you have, the better you get at doing a bulk amount in a short amount of time. I don't have a recipe, I just jokingly call it intuitive cooking. And um, really, when the basis of your meals is coming from stuff that's so fresh, you don't need a whole lot of recipes once you get used to cooking this way. Using recipes is so much fun, and they often come out so delicious. And it's really a lot faster to just chop stuff up and saute it and use it throughout the week. After my 90-minute cook-up's done, I probably will follow a recipe midweek to make something delicious for dinner but we could eat out of those things that I just made all week long um, and eat very, very well. The fourth part of meal prep is kind of having a loose plan that works for you. We definitely have a rhythm of what we eat every night. It's not like a hard and fast rule, but it does help a lot with meal planning to kind of have like, you know, do you do breakfast for dinner one night a week? Do you do Taco Tuesday? Taking that decision-making part out of things just makes things so much easier. And then you can always do something different. So just have a plan, keep it simple. And if there is a time when you need to get takeout, like you know you've already got your salad and your chopped up cucumbers in the fridge and it's so easy to pull those out and have some really great stuff to go with it. My last hack here is called the pre-made foods to the rescue and I pictured like half the people are being like, no. And then the other half are like, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of us are somewhere in the middle. And um, it's like, if you look at your week and you know there's nights where there's no way you can make dinner, be kind with yourself in that moment and set yourself up for success. Like, if you know you don't have time to make a stir fry or you just don't want to, if you have a couple of things in your pantry um, that are so easy that you know you're gonna do them and that you can still use some fresh stuff with it, it can be really delicious. So like keeping a plain frozen pizza in the freezer and then topping it at the height of the season with heirloom tomatoes and fresh basil and mozzarella, you just took 10 minutes and you got your salad out, you got cucumbers, and you got a beautiful meal. So. I sometimes, you know, in that myth of perfection, I'm like, I think me and the kids could just like plant some oats and we'll just, we'll just like harvest all that and we'll do, we'll start doing our own grains and we'll make a, see if we do this stuff, like a fire roasted pizza in the <laughs> oven and Jay can build that, that'll be fine. You know, it's like, Actually, we're gonna put some stuff on top of this frozen pizza and we're gonna say thank you for it and it's gonna be great, you know? <laughs> so the, we call it the blinging out the, the frozen pizza. Another one is making a really fancy and delicious grilled cheese. And I, I like it when the boys would be this, he's our oldest, he's, stuck, he's gotten old enough to be like, hey mom, you look a little tired, like maybe we could just have grilled cheese for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but we do some fun stuff with the grilled cheese, especially if you've already got your greens pre-cooked. You can put some beet greens on top of your grilled cheese. It's so good. That's one of my favorites is uh, beet greens grilled cheese with something raw, like a thinly cut radish. You know, early summer, the baby kill with garlic skate pesto. That's such a great combo. I just read a recipe last year for putting cherries in your grilled cheese. I was like, what? Stop it. <laughs> All these things are so good, and the things I wouldn't have thought of like a couple years ago. Now we just, if you've got the food in your fridge pre chopped up, it's easy to put it together into really delicious combinations. And same with making quick pasta. Um, I know grains don't work for everybody, 
but if they do work for you, it's you're always 10 minutes away from a good dinner, okay? You start the water boiling, you've got stuff pre-chopped up, if you've got meat thawed out, you've got dinner. The sixth change is learning how to do more and to get really comfortable with extra food. And even with large amounts of food or with stuff that's coming out of your garden that might seem like an intimidating amount of food, cases of food, or something that you got on special or that your farmers got for sale that's in season that they just have in a bountiful amount of. So that top picture of the really extra large bok choys, <laughs> um, all of that cooked down into like the tiny Pyrex container for the week, right? So it's not so intimidating once you get used to using it. And same with the root crops. I, when we had a home garden, I used to think like, wow, we've got 20 pounds of carrots. What will we do with all of those? <laughs> <laughs> and now it's like, oh, well, I grew like an extra 4,000 pound of carrots. No problem. <laughs> you know, like, I, I know it's not going to be a problem. Um, we use so many carrots because we're using them as a daily side dish. We're using them in soups and stews. You can steam and freeze them <laughs> for later. And they're really a great introduction into fermenting because they're already hard and they're kind of hard to mess up. So um, same goes with cabbage and all the cold crops. I don't use them as a replacement for starchy carbs but we kind of put them on top of our carbs. <laughs> and so we saw tabies and use them all the time in everything. And you can always steam and run them under cold water to freeze later. We've been eating a lot of those in the last couple months. And they're another really good beginner ferment or for pickling. Sadly, I'm the only person in my family that likes gazpacho, but I do love making it in the summertime. Um, we do tons of pickles because our kids love pickles so much and I know like pickles is the go-to when people think of canning. Uh, they're not as easy to can as so many other things even though they're not necessarily difficult. And for years I only thought of extra zucchini as going into zucchini bread, right? I don't make that much zucchini bread and a couple years ago um, I started doing the zucchini noodles and then I got a recipe from somebody at market for making uh, zucchini into relish like you would use for cucumbers and that's so good like that sounds so horrible <laughs> zucchini relish <laughs> but it's really really good and um, I've started using way more like I always want to have lots of shredded zucchini in the freezer now because we mix it in with our meatloaf and that really helps stretch out meat in the winter time because I still only make zucchini bread a couple times a year but I use a lot of zucchini. So the seventh change just as important as setting up a habit for bringing produce into your home is having an exit strategy. So what is your plan for cleaning out your fridge at the end of the week? And just like you need to have it on your calendar when you're getting into any new habit or routine, I would put this on the calendar until you get used to doing it. What's your shopping day? The day, or what's your harvest day? And the day before that, you have it on your calendar to do a fridge clean out. And so for lots of people, I know lots of our CSA members that's doing stir fry the night before pickup. And you can take that one step further and it's like, what produce do I have left in my fridge? I'm gonna use it all right now. Now that might be intimidating to use it all as fresh things, but any root vegetables you could make into a quick ferment or into a quick pickle. You could make a salad dressing out of all of last week's herbs. And you could freeze any sauteed greens that you haven't used during the week. So it's all gone. And once you start doing this, I've started doing this on Fridays now, so when I come home from market with lots of stuff and I open that fridge and it's like beautiful and bare and ready for next week's stuff, it's like, ah, it feels so good. Like I just set myself up for success and I feel really like well taken care of and less like my hair is on fire. <laughs> um, so put it on your calendar, set the timer, 
Like, I can clean out the fridge if I do it every week in 10 minutes. If I've missed a couple weeks, it takes longer. Like, so many things, and then you find things that take longer to clean up. All those good ideas from the sixth change, you can use all of those as exit strategies for all of your extra stuff for the week. So we're building all of these changes on top of a foundation, not on top of beating ourselves up and feeling guilty, okay? And what is your foundation? I've got some uh, handouts for you guys where it'll ask you kind of where you're at currently with your food habits and help you identify what your foundation is and specific intentions and goals that you can set up to work through these seven changes to start incorporating, to have less being on fire <laughs> and meeting more goals this year. So what do you use the ice cube trays for? Oh, great question. That's such a good question. Thank you. Um, I use the ice cube trays for lots of things. To zap any extra herbs I have that look like, ooh, how long has that been in there? <laughs> I'll, I'll zap it with some olive oil and I freeze it in the ice cube trays and then I move it once it's frozen into a Ziploc bag that says like frozen. Um, you blend it? Yeah. Blend it. So I it's blend it with oil. the oil, oil, freeze it in the ice cube tray mm -hmm. and then I've just got, so it's not really a true pesto, it's just like a ground up herb. But you can do that with, um, with water with any baby greens. So if I had, if I don't have time to saute like some extra baby kale, I'll just put enough of the kale in the blender with enough water so that it mixes down and I just freeze it. And um, I call that like a flavor bomb. Oh. Got a couple Ziploc bags of those and then in the winter time I can pull them out and throw them into something. And it's amazing how fresh and good they taste. Yeah. Yes. So then what do you, you bring it out and you're going to warm it back up or you're going to put that's, that's such a good question. So when I saute greens and freeze them and use them later, I usually put them in a soup that I blend with the immersion blender because they lose a lot of good texture, but they've still got a lot of good flavor. Yeah. Great questions. Yes. You take your, we call it the garbage, uh -huh. whatever you've trimmed off, your peelings, your garlic peels, your, your onion skins, anything that's been pre-washed, mm -hmm. and let them simmer in a little bit of water and strain oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Then yeah. make your ice cubes for your stock water, uh -huh. so that you've got your vegan or your whatever. Your veggie brown. You the same thing with your ice cubes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great tip, and I should have had that in there with the XX strategy is having a broth bag. I do just like all my little extra kitchen scraps, they go in a freezer bag. So it's like the very tips of the carrots, any peels, peels of onions, even the green onion like root part. Um, and you just keep it in a bag in the freezer and pull it out and make broth in the stock pot. Great. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. Anybody else? So it seems like you only have to do all this work in the summer. Oh. And then in the winter, you just We've got a lot of stuff. pull stuff yeah. out and you don't have to do it in the Well, that's, that's a great point. Like, I'm really busy in the summertime, so I don't make tomato sauce during the summer. I just freeze whole tomatoes in the bags. And so I am pulling those like 20 pounds of tomatoes out now a week and cooking them and making them into stuff. And so a lot of it I freeze very sloppily. <laughs> and then I pull it out and use it in the winter. And the same with my ferments, like I do big batches of ferments that aren't necessarily that creative or well flavored. And then I add stuff to them later. Um, like if I have a couple gallons of fermented beets, I'll add fresh dill to it later. Yeah, and kind of make it into a new fresh salad thing.
Mandy, you should uh, promo your little academy thing. Oh, thank you, Taylor. So uh, <laughs> Taylor just brought up part of our uh, firm this year. We've got a new feature on our farm. Our new tool for the year is uh, an online vegetable academy. It's seven bucks a month where you can sign up. I think it's $62 for the year. And we've got uh, just a wealth of cooking videos, recipes, and information. It's free to our CSA members <coughs> or available to the larger community. Uh, not completely for her. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. Of course. All right, well, thank you, guys.